So welcome everyone for another Rising Tide Foundation Sunday lecture. Um, last week we had a really great opportunity to uh, jump ahead a few thousand years or a couple of thousand years from the previous uh, sets of, of presentations that had uh, dealt with certain stories and mythologies uh, that were showcasing great truths about human nature, about the world uh, in ancient times. And last week we jumped into the world of Cervantes and the, the political and, and cultural battles that were being waged in Spain <clears throat> in the 16th, 17th century. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> and, uh, and we find the, that both in the, the previous presentations and in what we're going to continue to be experiencing in the coming weeks ahead, that great classical literature, the, the sort that really endures the, sands of the, the test of time, you know, like a lot of literature comes and goes, it's popular and it, and it, it accommodates the, uh, the tastes of an age in a moment, you know, but it doesn't really, a lot of literature just disappears. It's forgotten. And other literature, other music, other art seems to endure. It has that immortal quality. And um, when you penetrate behind a lot of it, I don't know if I would say necessarily all of it, probably all of it. Um, you find that there is more to the story than meets the eye. There's more than the outward uh, themes that are presented in a lot of the satires and a lot of the mythologies uh, that are passed down generation to, ge to generation. Um, and sometimes we were talking about, <clears throat> before this, this uh, recording began, we were chatting a little bit about uh, certain uncomfortable truths about the 20th century, especially the murder of JFK, certain things that... Um, intelligence agencies have been caught red-handed doing, and the dangers as well of those who try to uh, speak literally about the truth. Um, oftentimes, it doesn't go very well. And what is often re requisite, this is not a new thing, this is not a 20th century phenomenon. Oftentimes, if you want to say the truth in a time when you have injustice and empire and corruption pervasive, it is wise if you have your creative faculties honed and developed uh, with a good sense of humor and a good a bit of wisdom to wrap your your truths behind stories, anecdotes, um, other things that m may bypass the sentinels of pure immediate logic and strike at something deeper. So I think today it's a wonderful follow up from the, the story of Cervantes and his life and his world to look at a little bit of a almost contemporary of Cervantes, Francois Rabelais. And to do this, we have our great friend Fra Pascal Chevrier who has uh, ventured into the, the deeper reaches of, of Rabelais' mind than most people that I know. So I, I don't know who else would, would do a better job than uh, Pascal to introduce Rabelais to all of us. So Pascal, thank you. It's all yours. Okay, thank you, Matt. Um, I'm gonna share my screen now. Uh, hopefully everything works out fine. Okay, so. This is what I want. I hope you can see. Um, my, this is the first page. You can see it. Okay, good. Excellent. <clears throat> so, um, oh, I guess, okay, no worries. <clears throat> I won't see my notes exactly as I thought I would. No problem. Okay, so as uh, as Matthew has uh, said right in there in the introduction, um, we're going to be discussing uh, different concepts today. Um, we're going to be discussing freedom, censorship, religion, faith. We're going to be discussing um, the different periods also of history, especially the, the Renaissance period in France. So I'm going to try to make it uh, an introduction class uh, presentation because I, 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 I don't think most of you know exactly the character uh, Rabelais and his work. So I'm going to try to do it as maybe we'll see maybe a first part of many uh, but his works you'll see is uh, very vast um, and uh, I would say I would uh, even go uh, to the extent to say that he was actually the 
the most accomplished writer in terms of compiling, putting together basically all of the knowledge which had been recovered from uh, the antiquity until uh, his time. So, the, so this is the opening. Uh, so François Rabelais, also known as Alco Fribas Nazier or Serafin Calobarsi. So these are all anagrams of uh, his name taken out of François Rabelais. You can form these, these new names. Um, that's what Rabelais would use because of the censorship that was uh, so prevalent at, uh, during his time. He would not necessarily always publish his books under his own name, but he would use other names, pen names, like these anagrams from his real name. And so the idea is to, to see uh, what's going on, uh, this idea of, oh, I'm admitting people at the same time, sorry. Um, so I titled it, uh, Making Giants Out of Small People. And we'll see why uh, fairly soon. So I wanted to give you a bit of uh, the context. Hopefully this is gonna work. Yeah, there, there you go. <clears throat> so to give you a bit of context, what happened in the century before uh, Rabelais, uh, basically you had uh, a, a very crazy world. Uh, 1337 to 1453, you see you have the Hundred Years' War, uh, which goes on between England and France. Different, well, the, the issue behind it, if we can simplify it like this, is that the King of England wanted to become the King of France too. And so uh, uh, it was a war of succession because uh, of a lack of hair on the side of France. And so you had uh, a hundred years war that was launched. Um, so France was a kingdom that when you look at the map, uh, the uh, bluish purplish colored areas are what France had become over time. And uh, you see Gascony in, uh, in pink, or reddish and England. So Gascony was actually one of the fiefdom which was owned by the King of England, which made him a vassal of the King of France. But when the succession, when the heir of, uh, of France, when they, basically the, the, the king died without heirs and uh, the question was posed as to see who who would succeed, who would go, has to become the king of France, while the king of England, which was uh, a distant cousin, uh, son of the princess of France, uh, decided that he wanted to be the king. But that didn't necessarily work out with the nobility in France. So uh, the wars uh, went on. And if you're good in maths, you'll, you'll find out that it's not exactly a hundred years war. It's more like 116. But anyway, it's much, you know, much easier to say a hundred, I guess, for historians. So, um, and obviously the war was not going on all the time. There were time of respite, pauses in, in the midst of all of this insanity. And uh, so, yes, so um, the kingdom became very fragmented, as you can see on this second map. So that's uh, 50 years after the, the first one. So you can see that uh, there's different uh, fiefdoms that have gone with the king or are going against the king. <clears throat> So the, the legitimacy is, is not clear. Who, who owns France at that point? Who's ruling? Who's supposed to rule? And you have the, you ha during this Hundred Years War, you also have the, uh, the different great uh, characters which will emerge. One of them is uh, 
undoubtedly John of Arc, who will uh, push on the side of uh, having a, a French king and, you know, kicking out the, uh, the English. And that, that will work for a little time. Um, but you know the story, so, uh, so she will be burnt. Um, but eventually France will be able to actually kick the English out and reform a kingdom, a unified kingdom to a certain extent. So why, why wasn't it always war? Well, because people were dying from different things at the time. There was also the Black Death, the plague, which was going on. So you see the, uh, the areas when uh, different parts of Europe were touched by the, uh, by the plague. And so that also was a terrible event that led to, uh, I think, was uh, half of the parishes uh, in Europe kind of disappeared and a third about a third of the population, sometimes in different localities when the density was higher, it was up to half of the population which died, but uh, one third is already pretty significant. So that's also something that was going on during this Hundred Years War. So the, the war on the, on the land of France in the Kingdom of France and the plague uh, took a lot of people out. So that's something to keep in mind. Okay, that's an animation. I don't know if it's gonna work. Oh, you see it, yeah. So it's just an animation. It might not be super clear, <clears throat> but it gives an idea of the yellow being the French and the uh, darker, the English and the Bourbons working together. So yeah, there you go, until the end of the, of the war. Okay, um, anyway, so in the end of the 15th century, what you have for uh, the King of France is uh, mainly the, the, the lighter blue is uh, what the king controls and the different other colors are uh, different uh, duchies or uh, fiefdoms, which are owned by different uh, vassals of the king. So the, the English now are out, but now it's the idea of how do you actually uh, create uh, a unified kingdom. And so this is the uh, period of Louis XI, uh, who is also uh, nicknamed the Spider King because he uh, really uh, was able to uh, sew different webs in order to actually confound his enemies, those, the, the different barons, the different uh, um, very, uh, you know, medieval uh, thinking, uh, yeah, barons and duchies and dukes and all, all these guys, uh, counts, who didn't want to actually work together um, while the unification idea was to actually get rid of all of these different principalities uh, and actually get a nation state going. So this, this was really the movement of the restaurant has started already in, in Italy at the time. And uh, King Louis XI was really fond of uh, Florence wanted to emulate what was going on uh, in Florence as a city state, but wanted to make it as a nation state. So uh, we'll, we'll get to that very shortly. But if you, if you look at what's going on also at the time, you have the <laughs> Holy Roman uh, German Empire, um, which is uh, also a, a huge uh, a huge ensemble of different principalities. So this is also something that's going on at the time. I'm not gonna go so much into it, uh, but to make reference uh, to different things, but um, because uh, last week 
we had a, a good presentation from Adam Seria, who uh, basically uh, discussed much more of, of this aspect uh, by speaking of uh, uh, Cervantes and uh, Charles V. So I'm, I'm not going to go so much into this today, but just wanted to give you an idea of what it looked like at the time. Um, so Louis XI. Uh, so his task was to unify the kingdom of France. And so this idea uh, was new at the time, this idea of a commonwealth or an, uh, a modern nation state. This was had never been done before. And so he was the first one to really uh, try to get this idea of the city state, but really to a larger level, the idea of the common good, but on, on, a, a, on a vast scale. So the idea of the Commonwealth, uh, taken from his uh, book, The Rosebush of War, that he, he wrote at the end of his reign for his, uh, uh, for his uh, son, who would become the king. Uh, his idea of the Commonwealth is the idea of a, that cities were from the first, the name of the common good or the Commonwealth. And so he took 14 feudal duchies and 94 major cities and unified them in order to promote a, a common idea, an idea uh, of the common good uh, th that would actually promote industries, uh, promote development, arts, crafts. And so he, he coined the, uh, the, the motto, one law, one weight, one currency. And that was the beginning. So to develop cultural centers, to build manufacturers, to promote uh, and establish international trade fairs, and, and other things. I mean, he went all out and really launched a, a great infrastructure project for the whole nation, for France uh, to become a model. <clears throat> and so he wanted to attract people from everywhere, really. Uh, these international fairs, trade fairs, uh, were so, to, so that it could bring people that had a lot of skills in France and use their skills to, to build and develop uh, the, the commonwealth, the idea of a, 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 a purpose, a common purpose uh, on, on his, uh, on, on the kingdom, in the kingdom of France. So, uh, as I said, he admired Florence and he despised Venice. He actually said it in a, uh, during a, a dinner with the uh, Italian uh, ambassadors uh, that he wanted to emulate the example he had seen in Florence uh, where you had different people from, uh, from Milan, from Rimini, from Florence, from Venice. Uh, so he, uh, he discussed the, uh, his admiration for Cosimo de' Medici uh, who was running the Florentine Republic at the time and who had uh, opened a, uh, an, act, uh, an academy based on the, uh, on the idea of the Platonic Academy. Um, and so uh, he made it very clear and that really angered the Venetian ambassador who just basically left uh, without saying uh, goodbye uh, to the King of France. So, yeah. So that was pretty, uh, pretty uh, big, pretty bold at the time to do that. Um, so that's King Louis XI. I'm gonna, I wanted to read a little bit more of his Rosebush of War uh, to give you a sense of what he was trying to do because he is very much slandered. Even in France, uh, he is not the, uh, most popular king in the history of France. And uh, that's a shame, but that's also understood, understandable, because uh, when you understand the enemies that he made with Venice, for example, as I just said, uh, he was going to be slandered and he was going to be put in the, uh, on, on the wrong side of history for it. So 
if you read the the rosebush of war which is a great read it's not that long too so it, but it gives you an idea that's that's kind of his political will uh for his uh, son to give him instructions as to how to run the new the new kingdom he had just unified so he discusses and says in the second chapter uh, discussing on the world he says the greatest care a wise man must have in this transitory world is for his soul which is perpetual and which bears the charge for the activities of the body which shall rot upon death which spares not, neither the great nor in, insignificant noble nor villain strong nor weak rich man nor poor old nor young all are equal before it and it continues in the third chapter on the estate and duties of kings and princes it goes on to say consider the duty of kings and princes and their cattle years that their estate and vocation is to defend the common good both ecclesiastic and secular to uphold justice and peace among their subjects and to do good and when he, he discussed the cavalry years um there there's a note i have to to do there because he's <clears throat> he's not just discussing people who fight uh random people but he's really talking about the first establishment of a national army so people who are working fighting for common cause for common uh territory so this is the first time this is really th these are not mercenaries these are not just knights out of uh, you know the the middle ages who are fighting for their own little fiefdoms but they are fighting for on the on a national scale they are fighting for a common idea embedded in the nation in the nation state so that's what he means by cavalry years So I, I, I said I would mention uh, Charles V, or how uh, we call him in French, Charles Le Quint, who was the king of Spain, but also the Holy Roman Emperor, the king of Italy, the king and a king in Germany, uh, which was elected. The emperor was actually elected. He was uh, ultra, ultra Catholic and was the rival to the king of France, actually the king of France, which we're going to see right now at the time of Rabelais is uh, King Francis the first and so you have different kings that come after Louis the eleventh um, and these kings instead of following what Louis the eleventh says in his rose bush of wars of, of war um, instead of promoting the peace uh, go into uh, basically wars uh forever an endless wars in italy for example and so uh francis the first is also a king which is going to have to wage different wars and uh that that's going to undermine his uh his reign for for a little bit um so he's the king of france uh, he reigns from 1515 till uh, 1547 uh, he's known as the father and restorer of letters. He is uh, himself a poet. So patron of the arts. He's really into the uh, Renaissance mindset. And uh, he tries to cultivate to expand libraries and uh, basically uh, the production of paintings, statues. Uh, the Louvre really starts the collection that uh, they have to, they had the Louvre, it really starts with him. He's going to be uh, bringing Le, uh, Leonardo da Vinci to France uh, in, the, in the later years of uh, Leonardo uh, at the end of his life. Um, he's going to send also exploration teams around in, uh, to America to explore and take uh, possession of lands for him. Uh, he's going to be stuck in these Italian wars uh, that started before he became king. So that's going to be dominating his reign for, for a little 
for a long time. Um, he wanted to become the Holy Roman Emperor. That that could be uh, that could have been him, but he lost the election. So uh, princes uh, were to uh, electors, great electors, uh, uh, decided to go with uh, his. Uh, I think it was his cousin to a certain extent, uh, Charles V. And uh, when he when he uh, lost that election, he decided to ally with the Ottoman Empire uh, to basically flank uh, Charles V and try to to create uh, a, a, an alliance that would basically uh, give him more uh, an upper hand in Europe and around the Mediterranean. So that's for the king of France at the time. Oops, is it working? One sec. Okay, there you go. Okay, we're going to be discussing a bit of religion. Uh, don't want to bother you too much with that, but this is really important at the time. Uh, the indulgence traffic. Um, I don't know if you ever heard of that, of indulgences, what they are. Uh, we're going to be uh, looking into this right now. Uh, it still exists to a certain extent, even to this day. Uh, it changed, but at the time, um, religion uh, was undergoing, there, there was a lot of corruption in the church, in the Catholic church. And uh, there was a lot of critiques, critiques which were uh, uh, building up. Uh, so one of the reasons for that was the indulgences, basically a way to reduce the amount of punishment one has to undergo for sins, uh, either when you're still alive or uh, when you're dead. And so um, basically, uh, and I, 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 I took also another quote from uh, the Catechism uh, of the Catholic Church, which says that a remission before God of the temporal punishment, uh, punishments are due to sins whose guilt has already been forgiven, which the faithful Christian who is duly disposed gains under certain prescribed conditions through the action of the church, which as the minister of redemption, dispenses and applies with authority the treasury of the satisfaction of Christ and all of the saints. All that to say, really, uh, I think it was easier in the first quote, but it's a way to reduce the amount of punishment that you get for all your sins. And these um, were not necessarily um, bad at the beginning. The, the, the idea of basically uh, having having a way to uh, forgive your, get your, your sins to be forgiven and atone for them. But eventually it became uh, something that would be uh, put onto paper and these indulgences could be sold. And so you could buy basically your time out of the purgatory. And so eventually you can understand that that became pretty insane uh and uh it, it was uh it became just spreading all over the place and nobody could really control that so uh people believed in it and you know so it it, it was part of the of the church so people had to believe that it, it was something that was working uh were trapped in this system and it made a lot of people really angry because if you didn't have enough money, you know, how, how would you get the money to pay for these? And if you didn't have enough money, then, you know, you, you would be damned in the purgatory for a long time. Anyway, uh, so it became a, a really big thing. And uh, that's where the, the Reformation, uh, you know, uh, drive all of the, uh, the Protestant movement that's uh, one of the main thing, the, indul the, the traffic of indulgences. Uh, that, that's what uh, really uh, they promoted, they, they used as, as a weapon against the church. Now, what's the situation? Why, why do we 
talk about that? Well, because France was really an important country for the church, had been for a long time. Uh, just to give you a little bit of a history on that right now, um, the idea is that uh, since 496, so Saint Remy or Remigius was the Bishop of, of Rennes in France, and uh, he baptized Clovis, Clovis, who was the king of the Franks. Uh, but not only him, but he, he baptized the king and he baptized 3,000 of his warriors, of his soldiers. And that led to the complete conversion of the entire Frankish people to Christianity. So basically at that point, everybody was a Christian in the kingdom of, uh, of Clovis, had to become a Christian. Um, obviously then, if we go on, uh, the kingdom of France also took part into the Crusades. And so to deliver to the, the, the Holy Land uh, of the Muslim, they, those who took the cross were given indulgences by the church. Oh, so you see, if you were going to fight uh, in, the, in the Holy Land, if you were going to take part into the Crusades, you would also get these indulgences. And so you would basically uh, uh, make sure that your, your, your soul at the end would stay uh, the least amount of time in the purgatory. Okay, great. Um, then what you had was the Western Schism. Uh, and France also uh, was part of that. So you had uh, in, in the, the, the church already had split uh, from the, the West and the East. So you had the Orthodox Church in the East and the Catholic Church in the West. Uh, that was more around the uh, 11th century. But now in the 14th century, what you have is the Western Schism, where basically you get two popes who rule at the same time. One is in France, in, in, the, uh, in the city of Avignon, and the other, the other stays in Rome. And eventually you're even going to have uh, three popes at a certain point. And so one, which is seen as the legitimate one, and two others, which are seen as the anti-popes or the, the illegitimate ones. So the, the idea at the time was really this concept of ultramontanism, where, you know, it, is the power coming from Rome? Uh, how much power does the king have over religion? How much power does the pope have on uh, the secular world? And, and so that was a big issue um, that, that was going on, that had been going on for a long time. Maybe uh, some of you know, but the, the Pope was not just um, the leader of the church, but was also uh, basically like a king, had his own army and could wage wars against whoever, uh, whatever kingdom he would want. Uh, so... <laughs> This was a wild situation, and uh, France had been known, uh, has been known throughout history as uh, the uh, the eldest daughter of the church because uh, since uh, making reference to uh, Clovis's baptism, when you think about it, uh, the, the, this was the first time that you had a king uh, converting a whole people. Well, converting himself and getting a whole people to uh, to go with the the Catholic Church, and so uh, that was dear to the uh, to the church, and he used it uh, for a long time. So uh, basically, using the the king as you know, you have to be a good a good Christian. You have to to be uh, on the side of of the church, um, and so I, I gave you a bit of. Uh, who uh, and when it happened. So the, the Pope Alexander VI called Charles VIII his eldest son, and then Louis XII and uh, Francis I also calls, 
call themselves the first sons of the church. So you see that there's there's a big tie. It's pretty close, closely knit between uh, the kingdom of France and uh, the Catholic Church. Now that uh, so that raised a lot of concerns. Uh, people were wondering uh, as time went by and as uh, basically discoveries were made of uh, the old manuscripts, uh, basically the, the scriptures, looking at the Bible and trying to figure out what was going on, how the church could have become so corrupt, you know, and uh, taking par, part much more into the secular world than uh, on the spiritual level. And so humanism was really this attempt uh, at the time to recover the knowledge, uh, what, what had been done previously uh, at, at the time of, uh, of Plato, Socrates, all of the, this knowledge which had been put on the side by the church uh, because it was uh, coming from pagans. And so the humanists were, were Christians, but were trying to basically take everything that was good coming from before the time of the church, before Jesus Christ, and bring it into the culture, bring the best uh, of humanity, basically, uh, into the culture under the church. Because also, obviously, they, 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 they had seen, they understood the message of Jesus as also being the, the revelation, the, the, uh, uh, the most important thing. So they, they were trying to combine both. And the humanists were really in the middle of it all because they were attacked by the ultra Catholic who wanted to keep their system uh, as it was because they were on top of it all at the time. They were ruling the, uh, the, 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 the extent of Europe. So they were in charge. And the reformers on the other side were trying to basically break the whole thing uh wanted progress but in a way that would basically jeopardize uh all institutions all the institutions that had been created over time and so would it really be the the, the good idea to just break everything and rebuild uh from the bottom the humanists didn't think so and so they wanted to have reforms in the church, but didn't want to destroy the whole church. And so the question was, what are we as human? What, what is it that we're trying to emulate? And the humanists really had a program, uh, really when you look at it, starting with uh, Petrarch and others, uh, Boccaccio uh, in Italy, who really look into bringing back the uh, the knowledge of the ancients uh translating into latin translating figuring out finding the books uh there was almost nothing you know, at the time uh in europe very few books were scattered all over the place um but uh, very few of plato uh, and so they were trying to regain all of that knowledge, uh, which had been put on the side, buried and or left on the on the eastern side of the, the empire. Uh, whereas on the western side it was mainly Aristotle, which was uh, part of the uh, of the church system, the Aristotelian and the scholastics. Uh, thinkers were very, very uh, much on the side of Aristotle, very much using his logic. And so we're going to see there's, whoops, I'm always forgetting. Uh, so one of the characters, I mentioned Petrarch, I mentioned Boccaccio. There's also Lorenzo Valla. Um, I think he's, he's, an important guy, uh, even though I would say Petrarch was uh, much more important, but 
uh, concerning the, the issue at hand right now, when I, I, I was telling you about the indulgences, uh, he did a lot of work on uh, basically translating and understanding what was going on in the papers of the church, uh, the understanding basically what the, the laws uh, of the church, how they had been crafted. And so uh, he in 1440 proved that the donation of Constantine was a forgery. What that meant was that basically the Emperor Constantine had never given the, the Pope any temporal power, which was how the Pope had become basically a warrior uh, prince uh, or king, uh, had become a, a very important um, secular power. And so by proving that this was not the case, it, it completely shifted the whole thing around and, and would bring more power to the princes, the kings. And that would question the whole system. How, how could the, the church be so rich? How could they amass so much wealth? Uh, how could they trade all of these indulgences uh, they, you know, basically uh, running the show. And, and so that, that was a big thing at the time. It really, uh, some, some people say that he was really the first reformer of the church and inspired uh, Martin Luther and, and all these guys. Maybe so, but really he proved that the church had been running on a false pretense, on a, on a forgery and had been gaining a lot of power and territory and ruling as you know kings and princes uh, had done where whereas there was nothing legitimate in there um okay back to it and so the humanists were trying to rediscover the classics and also were trying to get the church back together the, the idea of the unification of nations uh, was also in the, in the mind of the humanists, but they wanted to also unify in terms of the soul, in terms of how to think about the church. If it was a universal thing, if there was one good message, then they wanted the church also to get rid of the corruption and to unify to get back under one message. And so by the work they were, they were putting into translating and going back to the original text by learning Greek, learning Hebrew, uh, looking really at the, at the, the, the scriptures uh, in the original, they wanted to get the message that everybody has to gather around these principles from the the original scriptures and unify and so i mentioned francesco petrarch before so he came during the 14th century and uh, he launched uh, a huge translation project uh, to to get all of the greek authors to be translated uh, in latin at the time and uh, he uh, he quotes uh, he says in his on his own ignorance and that of many others, um, which was a, a reply to Aristotelians um, from the church, because uh, he was amassing a lot of different manuscripts. He was he was getting a lot of people from around the Mediterranean to send him books of Plato, um, and he said uh, to uh, to these. Aristotelians uh, that no Christian and particularly no faithful reader of Augustine's books will hesitate to confirm this, nor do the Greeks deny it. They call Plato divine and Aristotle demonious. So th this is pretty shocking at the time, but he's basically saying that Aristotle is not to be uh, 
uh, reconciled in the church uh, has to be, Aristotle has to be pushed out. And Plato, as Augustine, St. Augustine had said uh, in the City of God, is the closest that there is in terms of, uh, of, of policy, of, uh, of, uh, of credo, uh, the understanding of the soul that Plato had is the closest to what the Christian faith has developed. And so he was saying to these guys, to the Aristotelians, that obviously he was ignorance of, ignorant of many things, but they were probably were uh, more ignorant because they had never had access to Plato since he was probably the only one uh, to, to get the manuscripts and to translate Plato at the time. Uh, it was not known in the West. Uh, maybe apart from maybe small parts of the Timaeus. So 1453, Constantinople is taken by the Ottomans. Uh, and that also uh, made it possible for more manuscripts to go from the eastern part of the, 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 uh, the Orthodox Church, the, the uh, Eastern Roman Empire, to the western part. And uh, more works uh, of Plato, of Aeschylus, Herodotus, Thucydides uh, were brought to the West at the time, and so more work for uh, this uh, the the uh, the people working uh, after Petrarch, the ones that Petrarch had uh, trained to translate, uh, had even more material to bring in. And so eventually, you have Erasmus of Rotterdam, uh, who has been na uh, named uh, the Prince of the Humanists, uh, was a theologian, a philosopher, and a priest. He wrote everything, every, uh, all his works are in Latin. And uh, he's mostly known for uh, his In Praise of Folly, uh, which he wrote in 1511. If you look at all of his works, the praise of folly is but 3% of what he wrote. So he wrote a lot more and uh, everything was in Latin. He also had a huge correspondence because he was organizing people all over the place in Europe uh, to get a reform of the church, but based on the humanist principle of education, the idea of mastering Greek and Latin translating the Bible, going back to the original sources and, and getting it to the uh, everybody, uh, especially since at the time uh, you had the printing press had been invented. So printing uh, was uh, a huge tool to bring out the knowledge, to, to bring it to everybody. Uh, he was also coming out of a, a, a group which was called the uh, Brotherhood of the Common Life, which had uh, created a network of different schools uh, in Europe to educate the poor, to educate the orphans, to take care uh, of basically the soul uh, of all these kids, uh, try to get them an education uh, and, and, and understand the scriptures, uh, basically live uh as as was said in the scriptures um so he was he knew about the reformers at the time the beginning of the the protestant movement he knew very well in what he was in correspondence with some of them and he knew that there was a movement in the catholic church for uh reform also so he, he knew from the inside uh that things had to change and people wanted to change the uh, the institution but also there were those that were just going out of the church and he was kind of in the middle trying to organize uh without any conflicts without any uh bloodshed uh the, the transformation of the church 
And so with the with the previous movement of translation, which has been started under Petrarch, that's what he was was continuing at the time and trying to really, he was the mastermind organizing all of Europe. Uh, he was really uh, an example to follow. And uh, he had this idea of synergism, uh, which is in the Christian theology is the idea that basically the, um, the salvation involves some form of cooperation between the divine grace and human freedom. Whereas on the other side, uh, what you had from the uh, the reformist uh, on the Protestant side was, uh, I think, was is monergism, uh, and that's the view that basically uh, it's all God. If your if your salvation comes, it's going to be because God decided it would, and you have nothing to do with it. So what he would, what what Erasmus was fighting for was basically people to uh, recognize their free will and that they could actually do something to make the world better and that they had they had to go back to the the uh, the original scriptures and he actually translated uh, uh, the, the the New Testament he found he found different uh, defects in the translation that had been made and so he decided to uh, have new translations in Latin and also in Greek of the New Testament uh, and made lots of enemies by doing that on both sides, on the Catholic side and on the Protestant side. But he, he uh, held fast. Uh, another character interesting that I wanted to mention to you uh, is also uh, Sir Thomas More or St. Thomas More now in the, in the Catholic Church. Uh, he was uh, pronounced a saint. Um, he uh, was also a collaborator of Erasmus. Uh, he was the Lord High Chancellor of England under King the Henry VIII. Uh, he's well known for his book, his book Utopia, fifteen sixteen. He was uh, a lawyer, a judge, an author, a philosopher, and a statesman. And uh, he received a classical education, New Latin and Greek, corresponded with, uh, with Erasmus, uh, was an opponent of the Protestant Reformation, and also of the separation of the king from the Catholic Church, for which he was convicted of treason and executed, even though he had, uh, he had retired from uh, his position uh, as Lord High Chancellor but he was deemed uh, treasonous and uh, was executed. So became a martyr and, and, and that's how now we know him as uh, St. Thomas More uh, on, on the side of the Catholic Church. So uh, he stood for principle and, and never let go. And uh, I'm not gonna discuss uh, the utopia and the uh, praise of folly uh, in this presentation, this this would be I think we we could do presentations only on these uh, on these subjects on both of these books uh, maybe at another time. But these were uh, very influential uh, documents at the time uh, and influenced a lot Rabelais in his composition of his own works. I wanted to mention uh, other contemporaries also at the time. Uh, so obviously I talked about the reformers. So I, I gave you a list and when basically they were active, when they, well, when they were alive and when they did uh, certain things. Um, so I'm not really gonna go too much into this, but just to give you an idea of who the uh, the major players were uh i also put the counter reformer ignatius of loyola uh, who was a bit later on uh after rabelais um or actually at the time of rabelais but his impact was at the end of of, uh, of his life so it wasn't exactly what Hamlet was fighting against at the time. Um, but 
that 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 also had a, a huge impact on uh, Europe and uh, what would happen afterward, uh, counteracting what Hable was doing, what the the humanist faction was fighting for. So on the other side, you have authors and protectors of Rabelais. Uh, the first one, well, I just wanted to mention that, you know, when we think about the classics that we have today, well, The Prince was written in 1513 by Machiavelli. So it was uh, a very recent thing also at the time uh, when Rabelais lived. You had uh, Marguerite de Navarre, who was the sister of King Francis I. She was a protector of Rabelais, and uh, he de dedicated his third book to her. Uh, different characters, uh, French people, Guillaume Budet, who was a Hellenist, so he was studying Greek and promoting the, uh, the learning of the, the Greek language, uh, creating schools, so the, the system of the Collège de France. He was a, a good friend of Rabelais. Uh, actually very uh, estimated Rabelais very highly because uh, Rabelais was uh, very good uh, in terms of Latin and Greek, had um, a very good understanding of the language uh, was, uh, and was proficient in it. Uh, so was seen as really like a, a, a great mind of his time already by, by important people in the, in the kingdom of France. Also, André Tiraco who was a jurist, also a Hellenist, so uh, learning and teaching uh, Greek. Also a friend of Rabelais, saved Rabelais uh, when he was uh, confined to a monastery. Uh, actually, Rabelais had to flee a couple times uh, to try to avoid uh, the wrath of the Catholic Church and or the, the Protestant too, but the Catholic Church was, was mainly the ones that were um, attacking him and uh, trying to uh, get his book out of circulation. Um, so he, uh, Henri Tiraco was able to, uh, to protect him also and get him out as he was a uh, uh, maintained prisoner in uh, some convent. Um, Yeah, he stayed a good friend of Rabelais until the end of his life. Um, and you have Jean Dubelet. Jean Dubelet is uh, probably one of the most important uh, person in the life of Rabelais. Um, he uh, was a diplomat and the Bishop of Paris and protected Rabelais. They also went uh, to Italy uh, together. Um, so traveled around Europe together and, uh, and uh, were really good friends. Uh, he protected him uh, many times, um, as, as did the other ones, Marguerite de Navarre, Guillaume Boudet, André Tiraco. And so that gave uh, a, good, a good wedge to Rabelais to basically uh, have the ear of the king of France, of, of Francis I, uh, because his sister was on the side of Rabelais. And so it was easier for, for Rabelais to get his ideas across. It didn't mean that the king would necessarily go with them, but uh, at least um, it was easier for, for Rabelais to uh, be able to get his ideas out and uh, not be burned at the stake as others had been uh, at the time. It was not, uh, it was a common thing for people to, uh, to be attacked by the church and, uh, and be uh, uh, basically seen as heretics and burnt at the stake. So who was Rabelais? He was a monk, a priest, a physician, a jurist, and a writer. He was a son of a lawyer and he became very good at uh, jurisprudence. Uh, he was a uh, it was a very skilled um, uh, in in terms of law and also in terms of language. He became very uh, very skilled with the the Greek and Latin la language and uh, did also his own translations 
of different uh, different texts. Um, different quotes I wanted to mention that come from his work. Um, one is knowledge without conscience is but the ruined of the soul. And so the idea of the, the Renaissance of the education system that the, the humanists were trying to bring about was to question, question the knowledge that had been um, taken for granted for so, so long or that had been put into uh, the, the curriculum uh, by the church and, and was just seen as the, the truth because the church said so. Well, the idea was to question all of it and, and try to understand what was behind, uh, to go back at the source at the, at the beginning and, and so to question everything. And so therefore ignorance is the mother of all evil. So to be an ignorant fool is uh, the downfall, not just of you, but of society. And that was understood by Rabelais and his friend Erasmus, uh, Thomas More and all the others. They understood that the system uh, was very shaky the world that we're living in was in co constant flux. And there was, uh, there, there had been great attempts, like for example, by Louis XI to consolidate, to create a new type of space, a new territory, the, na the na nation state ruled by principle, ruled by an idea um, of, uh, of natural law. Um, uh, or, 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 you know, the right of the, the people. Um, and that came, you, you can also go back and, and look at where this came from. And you can go back at, you know, to Nicholas of Cusa and, and, and the idea of natural law. Uh, other presentations went into this, so I'm not going to uh, go too much into it, but that's, that's something that has to be uh, taken, remembered right now. So we're going to look a bit more into uh, what Habla was doing. And of course, well, we have to look at uh, the critique. So maybe you've heard of Habla, and uh, most people have, but it, it, it stays, uh, as, uh, as was said at the beginning, it, it really stays at the uh, superficial level. Uh, so what, what we see uh, um, is taken for granted as uh, what it is uh, for the nature of things, but we'll see. Uh, I'm going to read this uh, quote by Le Bruyard from uh, his, uh, his book, his uh, book, The Characters, Des Ouvrages de l'Esprit. So he says, Marot, was another uh, was a poet, a French poet at the time, uh, um, a bit before Rabelais. Marot and Rabelais are inexcusable in their habit of scattering filth about their writings. Both of them had genius enough and wit enough to do without any such expedient, even for the amusement of those persons who look more to the laugh to be got out of a book than to what is admirable in it. Rabelais especially is incomprehensible. His book is an enigma. One may say inexplicable. It is a chimera. It is like the face of a lovely woman with the feet and the tail of a reptile or of some creature still more loathsome. It is a monstrous confusion of fine and rare morality with filthy corruption. Where it is bad, it goes beyond the worst. It is the delight of the basest of men. Where it is good, it reaches the exquisite, the very best. It ministers to the most delicate tastes. <laughs> All right. So this is uh, pretty harsh. So he says there's a lot of good, but there's a lot of, a lot of bad. And the bad is like the worst. You go, it, it, it's beyond the worst. So should we just take that and 
not continue into Rabelais, I guess that's 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 pretty much it. We don't need to go beyond uh, this guy. He's a, he's a learned man from 1690. So I guess I could end my presentation there. Maybe not, maybe not. I think we're gonna go and, and try to find out for ourselves uh, what is in Rabelais. So <laughs> hold on, it's not, it's not over. So, stories and language, the art of creation. Rabelais really wrote a lot, like he, in his book, he uses a lot from ancient Greece, from the mythology. He, he really brings everything, all of uh, basically the, the different um, understandings throughout the ages uh, of what human beings were, how they created these stories to try to understand the world they lived in and try to organize uh, an approach to how to live in it. And so he goes back to ancient Greece. He goes back to all of the mythology, the history. Uh, he translated a lot of these uh, historians, Thucydides, Herodotus. Uh, he knew them very, very well. And so he uses a lot of terms that were, that were coming from uh, the Greek, from the Latin, uh, and, uh, and, and, and in French, and wrote in French. So whereas um, Erasmus wrote everything in Latin, Rabelais saw it his job to actually get to the French people and try to talk to them uh, at all levels, the, the poor, but also the, the learned men. And so many, many levels in what Rabelais is saying. And maybe that's what confused La Bruyère from the quote we, we've seen previously, is that he tried to really encompass all of the human experience, the, all of our experiment, uh, and, and bring it uh, to, to everybody. So when you look at the words he used, that's, that's maybe not the greatest comparison, but anyway, uh, he used a lot of new words. And, and uh, yeah, so, so basically uh, enrich the language, whereas uh, other, uh, other uh, people in, uh, that are seen as the cl also classical uh in the in the french language like jean racine would use about eight thousand words rabelais used eighty thousand so that's that's something the the humanists were also trying to get uh what they call the encyclopedia it's very different from from what uh you see later on with the enlightenment it's not the same thing. That's why I put, it's not frozen words. Uh, and, and the habit discusses frozen words also in, in one chapter of, uh, of his book. Um, but he, they were trying with Guillaume Boudet, uh, they were trying to get a humanist design to basically uh, get an educational system, the, the spread of the, the, the study of the language uh, of the Greek, of Latin, um, and that was a big problem at the time because the church was against it. Uh, La Sorbonne, which was the theological uh, school at the time run in, uh, in Paris, uh, was not yet a university, but was the theological uh, uh, department. And uh, they had forbidden Greek. It was not to be studied. So Rabelais, as he was a monk, uh, be, uh, when, before he became physician, he was a monk and was trying to study Greek and, and go back into the scriptures, the original versions of the scriptures and translate them. And so his Greek books were actually seized uh, when he was uh, at the monastery. Uh, so that was the church had, had, had seen 
the study of languages of the Greek of Latin as a very dangerous thing. And you see in this quote, so Greek, a, stud, a study discountenanced by the church, which looked on it as a dangerous, as an on it as dangerous and leading to free thought and heresy. So if you study Greek, you would actually uh, have free thought. That is very dangerous. So you, you see what kind of a, a system was going on at the time, uh, which would implode, but that, that's what was ruling at the time. And so if Rabelais had not had uh, these good friends and protectors, uh, he would not have been able to uh, continue his study. So in 1523, his, his books, uh, these, his Greek books are seized and he gets them back about a year after. Okay, now let's get into the works of uh, Rabelais. Um, obviously, um, this is a bit different. I mean, we're, I'm giving you a presentation on an author which enriched the French language, and it's a, a presentation in English. So the translation I'm using are okay, are good, uh, but obviously it would have been much better to read in the original French and compare also with the, uh, with the modern French because what uh, Rabelais was writing in is called the middle, middle French. Oops, sorry, I'm going too fast. Um, so what he was writing in was, uh, was called the middle French at the time. Well, now it was the French of the time, but we call it the middle French as it evolved since then. Uh, so he wrote that these are the main, his main works. He also had uh, correspondence, uh, as I said, with uh, Erasmus, for example, uh, he corresponded with him and uh, it was pretty clear in one of his letters that uh, he uh, saw Erasmus as his inspiration, as his, uh, uh, basically his father. So it was pretty clear where, where uh, Rabelais came from in terms of his ideas, his principles. And so his works, you see them listed there, uh, different books that are the stories of giants. And stories of giants at the time were known, were, were pretty common. I mean, it, when, when we look at the mythology, there, there are giants, cyclops, uh, every kind of creatures. Rabelais uh, didn't like the way it was treated at the time uh, because it was mainly to divert people, just uh, get them to read funny stories, uh, but not really learn anything. Also, he was uh, he would attack uh, the this this kind of uh, chivalric. Uh, the chivalric orders of the time, the, the, the feudal system of knights uh, that was uh, prevalent uh, in, in the literature. And so you can, you can make the uh, connection with uh, Cervantes at this point um, pretty clearly. So you would attack that and he would use characters that were giants in order to actually bring uh, different ideas improve the understanding of the whole population of the whole French population and uh, not just of the, the poor people, not just the, the, the common man, but also uh, the, the learned. And, and that's why he would use a, a very interesting language. Um, so it, it, would, it would be seen as funny stories on the um, on the exterior, but much more to be found inside. And and Rabelais made it known to his his readers. Also, um, I just want to check my notes for a second. Um,
Yeah. So Rabla had been in the in the in different orders. He had been with the Benedictine uh, monks and also with the Franciscans. Uh, he didn't really like it though. Uh, he uh, he would study. He, he would find that all of the rituals uh, that they were getting into uh, were really vain and not really doing anything to help people. Uh, so he he really disliked that and uh, was was much more interested in studying uh, Greek, Latin, and eventually becoming uh, a doctor, be becoming a, a physician in order to help people to, to take care of them. And you can think of a physician for um, the body, but you can also think of a physician for the, the mind and the soul. And that's really, I think that's really how he saw himself. And that's, that's how he was trying to introduce in his work, a uh, really higher conception of what mankind is and, and what had to be done in order for the experiment of the nation state to continue, not to be destroyed because there, was, there were many attempts at that point to uh, destroy this idea of the nation state and, and get, uh, get the whole of Europe into uh, fratricides, uh, fratricidal wars. So let's continue. I wanted to give you a bit of an idea on the, uh, on the timeline of uh, when, when Rabelais is writing. So and, and Erasmus also, as I said, it was uh, his uh, inspiration. So when, when are both living and when, when does Rabelais write? Um, so this is just, uh, just to give you an idea. Searching for a philosopher king. So Rabelais was writing interesting funny stories about giants traveling around the world uh making uh, connections with different people um waging wars also and, and and tried to figure out how to live good lives um but he was also looking to inspire somebody and that somebody was a king of france and he wanted to uh, give him an idea of what to do, what was the, the proper approach in order to be a good king and in order to get out of the traps which were set uh, by the enemies of France and the enemies of, of the people, really, of, uh, of, the, of the Christian faith at the time um, of all Europe. So he was trying through his works to get the message across, not just to the, the, the populace, to the people, but also to uh, learned men and people at the court of the King of France, uh, of the, the, the danger of falling exactly for what the uh, physical perceptions uh, and to try to get to a higher level of understanding of what was ruling uh, the the institution was ruling the the system going on, all of these uh, useless wars. How to end them? Uh, there's there are so many characters. I just named a, a few, but Rabelais has many many characters in all of these five books, and so we could talk about all of them but i i decided not to it's uh it's too long for now uh for this introduction and it's uh it wouldn't really help us out so i just listed a few of them uh the main ones being gargantua who is the father of pantagruel uh who are uh lords kings in uh, uh in a region called Utopia. Uh, so <laughs> the kingdom of Utopia. So clearly you see the, the link uh, with Thomas More at that point. Um, different characters, uh, 
uh, are some good, some bad, but really there's always a mix. Uh, Rabelais doesn't really paint you a picture of black and white. He really gives you an idea that the human condition is not set in stone and that basically people can change. And so there are some bad characters and there's a lot of different people that die, but some good, some bad, some made bad decisions and some made no decisions at all and, and died anyhow. So really you have a mix of all of these things that Rabelais gives you in all of the stories uh, to make you reflect on, uh, on life and on what kind of decisions we make and why, why we make them. Uh, so I'm not going to go too much into this, but we're going to read uh, a little bit of Rabelais now. Uh, I decided these, these uh, illustrations by Gustave Doré are really the, the best one, greatest uh, illustrating uh, the works of Rabelais. It's, it's just very interesting. At this point, he's, uh, he's about to eat some pilgrims. That's Gargantua. Um, he was about to eat some pilgrims because they hid uh, in his uh, salad. Okay, so we get to read a bit of Rabelais now, understand uh, how he was thinking and what he wanted to present to the population, to the world. So in the prologue to Gargantua, he starts by saying, most noble and illustrious drinkers, a new thrice precious pocketified blades for to you and none else do I dedicate my writings. Alcibiades, in that dialogue of Plato's, which is entitled The Banquet, whilst he was setting forth the praises of his schoolmaster Socrates, without all question the prince of philosophers, amongst other discourses to that purpose said that the, he resembles the Silenes. Good friends, my readers, who peruse this book, be not offended whilst on it you look. Denude yourselves of all depraved affection, for it contains no badness nor infection. It is true that it brings forth to you no birth of any value, but in point of mirth. Thinking therefore how sorrow might your mind consume, I could no apter subject find. One inch of joy surmounts a, of grief a span, because to laugh is proper to the man. And so in these two paragraphs, uh, he's discussing uh, basically the idea, we're gonna go in, uh, into it a bit more, but this idea that um, the Silenes uh, that he talks about when he, he says that Socrates is like the Silenes, these were like boxes that had um, uh, that, that were painted with monsters on them, but re, uh, had uh, some precious uh, remedies, some pre precious cures in them. And so the outside uh, was not very beautiful, was kind of strange, but the inside was uh, very precious. And so he compares Socrates to the Silenes and says, look, what I'm writing to you might not look really good from the outside. It might be weird or, you know, uh, horrific, but you have to look inside. You have to go more in depth. You have to go beyond what you, what you read and try to figure out uh, what's really in it. And so you have to forget all of your, what you, what you thought you knew. You have to forget all of these uh, prejudices 
that you that you bring with you all the time and try to figure out what's the truth so it's interesting that he's talking to some uh most noble and illustrious drinkers so basically uh he covers what he's doing um he, he covers for the critique uh because he knows that he's going to be attacked big time but you know it's not it's not very that important it's just it's just for drinkers it's just for people who are drinking you know it's the, these stories are not not to be confounded with any serious business really or is it so in, he continues later on by saying in imitation of this dog it becomes you to be wise to smell feel and have in estimation these fair goodly books stuffed with high conceptions which though seemingly easy in the pursuit are in the cope and encounter somewhat difficult and then like him you must by a sigillous lecture and frequent meditation break the bone and suck out the marrow that is my allegorical sense or the things i to myself propose to be signif signified by these categorical symbols with assured hope that in so doing you will at last attain to be both well advised and valiant by the reading of them for in the perusal of this treatise you shall find another kind of taste and a doctrine of a more profound and abstruse consideration which will disclose unto you the most glorious sacraments and dreadful mysteries as well in what concern it your religion as matters of the public state and life economical hmm so what's that marrow that the marrow is you know what's inside of a of a bone so he's comparing he's saying like the dog who's chewing on the bone trying to get to the marrow which is the very very precious substance inside the the bone you have to do the same with these books you have to work on them and try to figure out what i put as the 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 very precious part what is to be uh to be reckoned with and so he's he's making fun of a lot of things he's making fun of uh what people took as you know the well when you you went whenever you made references to the to the bible you had to be really careful uh but he he would paint it in in this um in in the, in, in the same way that these uh stories um uh chivalric stories were were done and so you would it would use the same kind of format and and integrate his characters in them so these characters gargantua pantagruel uh many of them already existed beforehand and he he took them and transformed them uh made them better um so where did gargantua come from uh he, he discusses that uh so let's see would to god everyone had as certain knowledge of his genealogy since the time of the ark of noah until this age i think many are at this day emperors kings dukes princes and popes on the earth whose extraction is from some porters and pardoned peddlers as on the contrary many are now poor wandering beggars wretched and miserable who are descended of the blood and lineage of great kings and emperors occasioned as i conceive it by the transport and revolution of kingdoms and empires from the assyrians to the medes from the medes to the persians from the persians to Mas the macedonians from the macedonians to the romans from the romans to the greeks from the french and to give you some hint concerning myself who speaks unto you I cannot think, but I am come of the race of some rich king or prince 
in former times. For never yet saw you any man that had a greater desire to be a king and to be rich than I have. And that only that I may make good, uh, make good cheer, do nothing, nor care for anything, and plentifully enrich my friends, and all honest and learned men. But herein do I comfort, comfort myself, that in the other world I shall be so. Yea, and greater too than at this present I dare wish. As for you, the same or a better conceit, consolate yourselves in your distresses, and drink of and drink fresh if you can come by it. Uh, so, so basically, uh, he says, if if you take the genealogy, uh, Gargantua obviously uh, descends, you know, comes from uh, the the human that were there, or the maybe the giants that were there at the time of Noah's Ark. And so if literally you take the stories in the Bible, uh, then basically we all come from there. And uh, obviously uh, we have uh, been part of these lineage and probably we had uh, ancestors who were kings um, and, and very rich. And so if you're in a bad position right now, well, you can maybe consolidate yourself that you're, you're going to be better uh, later on. Or you know when after in the afterworld, uh, everything is going to be upside down. It's going to be changed. But also you come from uh, from the lineage, and it's it's only because you had all of these transports and revolutions and kingdoms and empires that you know things have changed. Uh, but hey, we all come from the same, huh? So that's interesting. And he also pokes at the kings. Uh, and the princes of the time that are not doing much for anybody, but just making their friends rich. Okay, so again from the, uh, the book from the Gargantua. Gargantua goes around and uh, he visited different cities. Obviously, Paris is, uh, is the main one in France. So he has to go there. And uh, he's not very welcome in Paris. And uh, uh, Rabelais uh, tells us what uh, Gargantua then did to the Parisians uh, because they, they were not such a, a great people at the time, I guess. So he says from chapter one, section uh, 17, some few days after they had uh, refreshed themselves, he went to see the city and was beheld of everybody there with great admiration. For the people of Paris are such simpletons, so bado, so foolish and fond by nature that a buffoon, a peddler of indulgences, a sumter horse or mule with cymbals or tinkling bells, a blind fiddler in the middle of a cross lane shall draw a greater confluence of people together than a good evangelical preacher. And they pressed so hard upon him that he was constrained to rest himself upon the towers of Our Lady's church. At which place, seeing so many of, about him, he said with a loud voice, I believe that these buzzards will have me to pay them here my welcome hither and my proficient. It is but good reason. I will now give them their wine, but it shall be only in sport. Paris. Then smiling, he untied his fair braguette and drawing out his John Thomas into the open air, he so bitterly all to be pissed them that he drowned 260,418 besides the women and little children. Wow, my God, what happened there? So this is, this is I wanted to, to put that in because obviously when you hear about Chablais, you will hear these stories 
And uh, that's what Labrouillard was uh, mentioning before in his critique, uh, said that, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's scatological, it's, it's not uh, when it's the bad, it's the worse. And so uh, Rabelais, I think, was making a lot of fun of, uh, of the people of the time and how uh, they saw the, these giant stories as being so, so important so interesting uh whereas you know it was and, and he says it right there he says that they would they would be more interested by all of these absurd things um and then a good evangelical preacher and so there was something that was lost to the people at the time that they were not really uh taking care of the essential they would be fooled by by their sense their senses and so uh gargantua found them so uh despicable that uh he pissed on them uh urinated on uh the parisians and uh what paris means here in uh in the text paris means by laughter so there's a pun that's that's done there on the on the name of the city so it was just for laughs basically now to get into in the in the Gakaltra, uh it's a lot of fun but it's also you have a lot of interesting things especially concerning education uh, that's going to be what I want to discuss uh, uh, soon. But when you look at uh, the letter of Grand Bousier, who's the father of Gargantua, um, Gargantua left to study, and Grand Bousier uh, sent him a letter to tell him to come back because uh, there's going to be a war, there's something that, that's going on, an invasion, and he has to come back and, and uh, protect the land, protect the kingdom of Utopia. So Grand Gouzier writes to Gargantua and he says, the exploit shall be done with as little effusion of blood as may be. And if possible, by means far more expedient, such as military policy, devices and stratagems of war, we shall save all, all the souls and send them home as merry as crickets unto their own house. So the idea at the time uh, France was in wars uh, and perpetual war in, uh, in Italy had been for a while. And there were other wars that were going on or brewing uh, with the, the Protestant. And so the idea that is transmitted there in the Gargantua is basically that wars can be won different ways and it's not just to send uh, the military and crush everybody that's going to make it better but you have to devise uh, better policies better stratagems uh, in order not to kill people uh, but to bring them back on your side different ways and so that's where you see that Rabelais has a, a, an understanding of what's going on and, and is trying to send a signal that, you know, all of these wars uh, are not going to make France better. It's not going to work. So you have to find another way and you have to uh, basically see the advantage of your enemy and what you're going to do. And so this, this is a very important, uh, a, a very important idea that he's transmitting. Okay. To continue in the Gargantua, and then we're going to go into Pantagruel, which is the son of Gargantua, another giant. Uh, and uh, actually the first book, but I put them in order of the father and the son, but Pantagruel was uh, written before Gargantua, anyway, 
don't want to mix you up on this, but this is uh, continuing on the Gargantua. I, I told you about La Sorbonne, which was the uh, theological faculty at the time, uh, which was attacking uh, Rabelais and his friends, the humanists, for not being uh, enough uh, with the Catholic Church, uh, enough with the dogma and the, the rules of the time. Um, so I just gave you the, uh, the date for the, the Sorbonne. Um, Gargantua, uh, in the Gargantua, uh, what Rabelais does is that he creates his own abbey, the Abbey of Telema, and uh, makes fun of uh, how the, uh, the different uh, monkish orders uh, that were created in order to, to keep people uh, in the Catholic Church. There were a lot of different orders which were created and the uh, monastic life of the monks uh, that he lived when he was with the Benedictines and the uh, Franciscans. And so he's trying to create a different style of abbey. And uh, yeah, let, let's read this. So all their life was regulated not by laws, statutes, or rules, but according to their free will and, and pleasure, they rose from bed when they pleased and drank, ate, worked, and slept when the fancy seized them. Nobody woke them, nobody compelled them either to eat or to drink or to do anything else, whatever. So it was that Gargantua had established it. In their rules, there was only one clause, do what thou wilt because people who are free, well-born, well-bred, and easy in honest company, have a natural spur and instinct, which drives them to virtuous deeds and deflects them from vice. And this they called honor. When these same men are depressed and enslaved by vile constraint and subjection, they use this noble quality, which once impelled them freely towards virtue, to throw off and break this yoke of slavery. For we always strive after things forbidden and covet what is denied us. So obviously everything he says, he, he creates these situation, uh, not necessarily to say that this is exactly how it should be run, but clearly to to create such a such a different uh world that we have to ask ourselves would it be the best way to to do things or what what should we do how should we organize society what what is all these uh different orders um and how do they work is is it is it good for society that you have all of these groups uh, which basically are um, take themselves out of the of the world, try to to uh, live outside um, of of the world for different ones. Not all of them, but some of them. How how should we uh, organize society? So obviously, this is not just a question for the the common people, but also for the king and princes. How, how do we organize society for the best? Do we just leave people uh, like that, free of doing whatever they want? Is that gonna work? Or should we be so stiff and like what he had seen in the different orders, the different uh, congregations? That's, that's a question. Obviously, there's different rules, other things that go with that at uh, Thelema. I'm not going to go too much in details, but this, this is, uh, there, there, there are other rules um, that, that go with that, with the mo monastic norm of uh, Thelema. Um, I think I'm running out of time though, so I'm going to go a bit quicker. Uh, so here is the Pantai Ruel. So <laughs> you see that Pantai Ruel needs cows to be able to uh, feed himself. Uh, 
and it's seventeen thousand nine hundred and thirteen cows that need that are required to furnish the uh, the milk for uh, for Pantagruel. So anyway, whoops. interesting drawing. So I, I told you about education. Now that's where we get really into it. Uh, it's the letter from Gargantua to Pantagruel, uh, dated uh, the 17th day of the month of March, sent from uh, Utopia to the kingdom of Gargantua. He says, most dear son, amongst the gifts, graces, and prerogatives with which the sovereign plasmator God Almighty had endowed and adorned human nature at the beginning, that seems to me most singular and excellent by which we may in a mortal state attain to a kind of immortality. I intend and will have it so that thou learn the languages perfectly. First of all, the Greek as Quintilian will have it. Secondly, the Latin and then the Hebrew for the Holy Scripture's sake, and then the, the Chaldee and Arabic likewise, and that thou frame thy style in Greek in imitation of Plato, and for the Latin after Cicero. Let there be no history which thou shalt not have ready in thy memory, unto the prosecuting of which design books of cosmography will be very conducible and help thee much of the liberal arts of geometry arithmetic and music i gave thee some taste when thou wert yet little and not above five or six years old proceed further in them and learn the remainder if thou canst as for astronomy study all the rules thereof let pass nevertheless the divining and judicial astrology and the art of Lulius as being nothing else but plain abuses and vanities. As for the civil law of that, I would have thee to know the text by heart and then to confer them with philosophy. Now in matter of the knowledge of the works of nature, I would have thee to study that exactly and that so there be no sea, river, nor fountain, of which thou dost not know the fishes, all the fowls of the air, all the several kinds of shrubs and trees, whether in the forest or orchards, all the sorts of herbs and flowers that grow upon the ground, all the various metals that are hid within the bowels of the earth, together with all the diversity of precious stones, that are to be seen in the Orient and South parts of the world. Let nothing of all these be hidden from thee. Then fail not most carefully to peruse the books of the Greek, Ar Arabian, and Latin physicians, not despising the Talmudists and Kabbalists, and by frequent anatomies get thee the perfect knowledge of the other world, called the microcosm, which is man. And at some hours, of the day apply thy mind to the study of the holy scriptures first in greek the new testament with the epistles of the apostles and then the old testament in hebrew in brief let me see thee an abyss of and bottomless pit of knowledge for from henceforward as thou growest great and becomest a man thou must part from this tranquility and rest of study Thou must learn chivalry, warfare, and the exercises of the field, the better thereby to defend my house and our friends, and to succor and protect them at all their needs against the invasion and the assaults of evildoers. Okay, so this, uh, this is very interesting. Uh, if you look at what he's discussing, uh, so obviously languages was a big focus of the, uh, the, the humanists at the time. And in his books, basically Rabelais was bringing up the curriculum that was uh, fought for 
by all of these humanists around Europe that wanted to uh, completely overhaul the education system. Uh, it was not just an idea. The, the term democracy was not a commonly uh, pronounced word at the time. That was not exactly the idea. But the idea was really to get people to start thinking by themselves. And instead of just being sheeps following, like another uh, episode in the uh, fourth book, which uh, for sake of time, we're not going to get into right now. But there is an episode where sheeps are on a ship and, uh, and Panurge, the friend, uh, one of uh, Pantagruel's friend, decides, uh, well, had a, an argument with the, uh, the shepherd, with the owner of the sheep, and decides that he's just going to throw these sheep overboard. And he does that. And all the sheep, uh, which he says, uh, quoting Aristotle at that point, says that uh, sheep are probably the most uh, stupid animal that ever were. Uh, all of the sheep jump overboard and with the shepherd trying to uh to stop them rubbing onto a ram uh the ram also jumps overboard and everybody drowns all the sheep and the uh the shepherd drown um so what's you know you could you could ask what's the moral of that story um and so i i i think it's it's up to you to figure it out but really if you think about it how do how do people react these days how how do opinions how are opinions formulated and how do people go about them um i think it didn't really change since the time of rabelais and so that's that's what uh, that's what was the attack on on the way people would conform with the authorities of the time and and how they they would uh, they would see themselves what part they would play in in the, the grand scheme of things um, we're almost done I, I know this was a bit long as an introduction but uh, we're getting there I just wanted to give you a bit more of the uh, great illustrations that were made by Gustave Dory, uh, representing uh, the giants. You can see on the right, Pantagruel, who's studying. Um, so everything that was mentioned by uh, in the letter uh, by Gargantua to Pantagruel uh, is also represented here. So the idea of, uh, of learning everything that you could become a bottomless pit of knowledge basically getting everything that you could from all over the place not just from the west but also the east and the not just the the modern but also the ancients really understand and figure figuring out for yourself what is true and that that was a big uh, a big thing at the time because um, you it, Rabelais crafted it in these stories to make sure that he would not uh, uh, get in trouble with the Inquisition and the uh, the Catholic Church, and he did get in trouble with them uh, many times. He had to flee uh, and go uh, get protections from his friends. Um, so even though he was creating all of these stories with giants, um, he would not be necessarily safe. And uh, But his attempt was to make sure that the newly created nation state would, uh, would go on and that the, this principle of statecraft would be transmitted to the next generation and that eventually a philosopher uh, king would uh take over basically and uh and and change the rules of the game um 
many things uh, I skipped over. Um, I'm kind of sorry for that, but I think this was a long presentation. So I think I'm just going to end it like that uh, if people have questions. Well, that, that was a, a very good introduction, Pascal. Thank you. And uh, already in the, the chat box, uh, there were a couple of people who wanted to pose a question to you. Um, I myself have a, a question I might want to pose as well. Um, but we only have time for a little bit. Uh, so the first person whose name that I saw was Adam. Oh, hey, Adam. Oh, no sound. Adam, you I, are likely on mute. I cannot hear Adam. Oh. No, I see your mouth moving, but yeah. you don't hear anything. That's Hi. because I have my microphone on mute. You hear me now. Yes. All right. Well, it was, it was a wonderful presentation, but when you, got, when you read an excerpt, it sent my antennae up. When it referenced the Abbey of Thelema and Do As Thou Wilt, uh, I assure, I'm sure I'm not the only one who thought of Alistair Crowley. And I was wondering what, if Crowley drew his ideas from this, or uh, it was just a reference he read, or, and then part of that is doesn't Crowley's conception of it take the idea to its perverse extreme? I just wanted to know your thoughts on that. Yeah, exactly. You got it. Uh, so from what I from what I know, it, it comes exactly. Crowley just decided to take the uh, the idea and push it to the, the extreme. Uh, but clearly, uh, has not done as much work as Rabelais and didn't really understand the uh, the uh, what what was uh, the marrow inside of the uh, the envelope that uh, Rabelais was giving. Because that's that's the thing. I, I didn't really want to. That you, you could have a lot of different interpretations, and that's up to people to actually read and try to figuring out these ideas. Because I don't think that it's it's as great when you know you're being told, oh well, this is what he means. You know, this is that's the answer. Just look at the end of the textbook. Well, you know the really Rabelais made it hard to a certain extent to understand but I think that that was his uh, leap of faith that people eventually would uh, would take it to heart to actually figure it, figuring out uh, what he had put in there it could take uh, a long time but uh, he had faith so yeah, no, that's a good observation. Exactly. Thank you. Uh, Stephen also had a question. Uh, Pascal, thanks very much. Uh, I hadn't really encountered Rabelais before in my limited reading, so I learned a lot. Uh, and I'm grateful for that. Uh, the, the one thing that, above all others, I think stood out for me is perhaps a simpler one, and that was the association of ignorance and evil and the thought that it not only can lead to an individual downfall, but a collective downfall. Uh, and it seems to me that that is as applicable today as it was in Rabelais' time. And if you look at uh, so much of what Rising Tide seeks to accomplish uh, in terms of uh, exposing the hidden apparatus of governments that appears to be working to keep us in ignorance, uh, it seems to me that we're dealing with that sort of evil even today. And of course, you, you, you see the utility of the study of history uh, in applying it to our own times. I was just wondering if you had any thoughts on that or if that had as a, uh, stood out to you when you saw that in your research. Yeah, well, I have many thoughts on that. Um, <laughs> first of all, I didn't really go into, I mentioned, I mean, we, we discussed uh, this idea that it's, you know, the, the Catholic Church was dealing with a lot of corruption inside of itself um, for a long time. And uh, you had the princes and the kings on the other side. Uh, I didn't really, um, you know, uh, go too much in depth into understanding the evil so much. 
we would have to go into uh, really more of the case of Venice and Aristotle to really understand more what was going on at the time. But um, this is uh, this is what uh, was shaping the uh, the European wars. You know, the all of the distraction, all of the uh, intelligence operations which were being ran from Venice and elsewhere. Um, I briefly mentioned Henry VIII, uh, Rabelais, and Jean Dubelé, his protector, who was the Bishop of France. Uh, he was sent to England to actually try to stop Henry VIII from breaking with the Catholic Church. And uh, it didn't work because you had uh, Francesco Zorzi, who was the, uh, <laughs> we called him the, the sex um, advisor to Henry VIII. And so Henry VIII followed the advice of the Venetians who had been sent to his court in order to uh, get him to break with the Catholic Church. And the humanists were seeing that as a, a, a big threat uh, because they, they wanted to unify uh, all churches. They wanted to get people to uh, basically uh, get together behind one uh, message, the gospel, and uh, a good translation of the gospel, not just uh, uh, different fragments that were used for different purposes, but really to go back to the roots and figure out uh, what it was really and how to apply that uh, in the real world. So, yeah, there's a lot of things to be said, but I, I, I think, uh, you know, for another presentation, maybe. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Sean wanted to just endorse his, uh, his view that he's looking forward to part two to continue on the, uh, the layout that you, you set up. <clears throat> and I, I also uh, back that, that idea up as well. Uh, Ian has a question. Uh, yes, Pascal, thank you very much for that presentation. Uh, myself, I studied in France, so that's something I, I went over when I was younger. Um, what I wanted to, to know is that uh, Rabelais was pushing unexpected ideas, fringe ideas, uh, and how did it actually uh, shape, what was the impact short-term, medium-term in France and in Europe and did it have an impact changing from the inside or was it fermenting revolution? Mm -hmm. Oh, good question. Um, that's something that also I would like to know a bit more about because I've, as I was doing the research for this presentation, um, there's different ideas, different uh, trails that pop. And um, I wasn't, too sure of where to go and, and, and for the sake of time I, I couldn't really uh, launch myself into it but if you think about it um, you have uh, you have many wars which are started by the end of Rabelais' life you have the Council of Trent you have uh, the Counter Reformation you have all of these um, you have uh, many wars uh, religious wars that are launched well we could actually take it from 1492, the expulsion of the Jews from Spain, until the Peace of Westphalia in 1648. And all of this is basically warfare going on, on religious, for religious pretexts all over Europe. Uh, obviously, you have the Thirty Years' War, which is uh, a huge bloodbath. But really, you have wars all throughout that time. And... So how do these wars get started? That's one thing. How do they get resolved? And who resolves them? And so there's another king that comes later on, Henry IV, which is, uh, which is better known in France. Uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, lycée colleges that are named after Henry IV for good reasons. Uh, I think he was a, a good king, and I think that he represented these ideals 
to a certain extent. I, I don't think that, you know, you can 100% say, oh, yeah, you know, he was the philosoph philosopher king that Rabelais wanted. But I think that he represented this idea of tolerance, which was in the, uh, in the humanist uh, party, and that he tried to basically connect uh, coming from a Calvinist background and abjuring, converting to Catholicism in order to become the king. He represented a character which uh, embodied that type of understanding uh, and he was assassinated, right? So a lot of warfare and some interesting characters, also kings that, that try to do good. Um, I can't say that, you know, it's, it, it was exactly the design that Chabla had planned, but I think that's, that's something that uh, has to be looked in, into a bit more. Thanks. Yeah, that was actually touching on my question too, because when I was doing a little bit of the, the history work for the for the on, on the piece of Westphalia, the issue of Henry of Navarre came up a lot, and uh, the Duke of Sully, who is like one of the the I guess masterminds behind a lot of the the grand strategy that Navarre uh, utilized to declare war on the oligarchy, the the encrusted oligarchy of France of, of his day, and really try to unify the country around big projects and a big crackdown on corruption. And I was, I was curious if that was my question is, it, did you know of any direct links between the Rabelaisian circles and Sully and these guys who were practically on the ground? But I guess you sort of addressed that just now. Okay, yeah. good. Well, I would have said no, but <laughs> anyway. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, that's really, really great, Pascal. I mean, this is a, <clears throat> a very fantastic introduction. We're going to have this up on our website very shortly. Hopefully, we'll be able to have a, a French version at some point soon as well for uh, to, to fully appreciate the the richness of the language that we couldn't, as as Anglophone speakers, fully appreciate. Um, Adam as well <laughs> tackled that same issue dealing with the uh, the enrichment of the the Spanish language with Cervantes, and you know, it's we're getting at it in the the way that we can, but um, this sets the stage very well as well for next week where we're going to have uh, Cynthia going through something that will also tackle. Venice from another angle, uh, from a, an author a couple hundred years after Rabelais, um, named James Fenimore Cooper, who was an American uh, literary figure who did a lot. I mean, he wrote a lot of stories, short, long alike, but he was also politically playing a very interesting role and exposing some very interesting, um, often misunderstood elements of, of geopolitics. With, and she's going to focus a lot on the, the story of the Bravo. Um, which really takes us into the lagoons and the evils of Venice in, an, in another way. So I hope everybody can uh, be there for that one. I know this Tuesday as well, we have Martin Seif in the evening, who's going to do his, uh, part two on the assassinations of the late 19th century, um, specifically with a focus on uh, William McKinley's murder and uh, that of Tsar Alexander II. So that'll be at 7 p.m. Eastern time. And uh, feel free to invite your friends and and other truth seekers to the uh, the upcoming events. So thank you everybody and thank you Pascal. Great. Right. Take care everyone. Bye. Bye. Merci Pascal.